All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening for tonight's program. Most of you know me, but for those who don't, my name is Alexandra Schneider. I'm the Manager of Public Programs and Visitor Services for the History Center, and I'm so thrilled to welcome you to this evening's event. Um, most of us are very familiar with Zoom at this point, um, but a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. For those of you who do not already have yourself in speaker view, there is a little toggle button at, at the top right corner of your screen. If you want to select speaker view, that'll be the best method for viewing the program. If I haven't already rudely done so for you, if you could please mute your microphones to cut down on any ambient noise during the program, that would be great. Um, we're in for a real treat this evening. This is going to be a fascinating talk. If you have any questions during the program, we will have a Q&A session at the end of Dennis's presentation. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat icon that pops up. If you wanna address your questions to Carol Summerfield, she's gonna go ahead and moderate those at the end of the program. Um, before we get started, I wanna say a couple thank yous. Maddie Dugan has generously continued to make our Zoom programming possible um, throughout the pandemic as long as it continues to sort of drag onward. Um, and also a very special thank you to the Sheridan at Green Oaks for sponsoring this evening's program. I wanna turn it over for a moment to Karen to talk a little bit about her wonderful organization and introduce yourself. So Karen, go ahead. Well, thank you, Alex. And thank you everybody um, for coming tonight. I, um, I am the business development coordinator for um, the Sheridan at Green Oaks, which is a retirement community in Lake Bluff. We have independent living, assisted living, and memory care. And um, one of the things that we love um, at our in our community is is continuing to learn and reminisce, and um, also you know uh, share the love of of travel. And when I saw this as a program, I told uh, Tess, our dress, director of sales and marketing, can we please sponsor this? Because this is so dear to my heart. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to welcome all of you um, here. And um, thank you again, um, Dennis. Thank you for uh, all your work. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, you so much. And thank Karen. you so much for your sponsorship. Yes, thank you very much, Karen. It's been really great to have you and your groups into the History Center too to visit us. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so now I'm gonna turn it over to our executive director, Carol Summerfield, who's gonna introduce our speaker this evening. Well, thank you all so much for coming. And for those of you who have not made the exhibit, I invite you to come in. We'll be open Tuesday and Wednesday, 10 to four next week, and then until one on Thursday. And then we don't open again until after the new year, but the exhibit will be up through April. And um, Dennis was one of our contributors for this. So I would like to introduce Dennis Kremen, who is a professor at Lewis University, which is in Romeoville, um, Illinois, a very charming campus. He's been the chair of the history department. He's the current academic director for the LaSallean University Center for Education program in Rome. And Dennis earned his doctorate from um, Loyola University in Chicago. He is an award-winning educator. Um, I have known him for most of his career and have um, been delighted that he's become involved with the um, museum. He is a delightful presenter and um, incredibly academically well-rounded. Um, he is uh, books are Grant Park, Chicago's Front Yard, which won Book of the Year Award by the Illinois State Historical Society back in 2014. His current research is actually on pilgrimage, which aligned nicely with this exhibit. And as part of his recent sabbatical, he walked a section of the El Camino de Santiago in Spain to visit the remains of the Apostle St. James the Major. And he assisted Lori and me in writing the exhibit. So... I would like to welcome Dennis and um, you may kick it off. Thank you so much, um, Carol. It's so nice to see so many friends on the Zoom this evening. Alex, thank you for all of your hard work. And Karen, um, you know, the work at the Sheridan at Green Oaks is really important. So um, uh, thank you so much for your sponsorship. And um, I look forward to um, one day hearing about your own Camino. Um, buon Camino, my friend. Um, I'm going to um, uh, share my screen right now and, and kind of go into uh, uh, the, the program. Um, and I'll go relatively quickly, um, but this idea of pilgrimage as transformative travel um, 
and the idea, look at that great day, Carol, that we had within the rain um, at the, the History Center there. If you haven't been, um, you must simply must go um, and have a great explore. Um, what I hope to do is um, uh, profile a little bit the Milestone Travels exhibit, um, talk about pilgrimage in a global context, and then talk about this idea of pilgrimage um, the idea that I use with my students, place-based learning, um, and uh, a little bit about the, the work that I did on Constantinian basilicas in the past, and then kind of just, um, the I've been on sabbatical this semester, so talk about the uh, Camino that I did back in um, September into October of this year. So that's the menu right now. Um, and also I, I posted a picture of the uh, Barry McLean's um, um, collection there. I was so pleased to join so many of you at the um, um, museum trip to that site. Um, that was such a thrill uh, to, to go. Um, so doing great work. Um, Milestone's travel is now up. Um, uh, this idea of leaving home to find yourself um, is a really common refrain. Um, loved working with Lori. She had really found so many great stories and so many artifacts from the community. Um, Carol, always so fun to gallop along with you um, on these uh, projects, uh, which is really great. Um, this idea of milestone travel um, really centers around um, a number of areas, but I want to just stress here, um, these adventures can be regional or across the globe. I'm reading the second paragraph, short jaunts or multi-month adventures, and they can bring us new discoveries, connecting us to the past and to our larger history. We travel to explore our own family's past or expand our educational experience or test our limits. Um, and when you go to the exhibit, the major theme sections are uh, developed, um, adventure travel, spiritual travel, the grand tour, which is this idea that really I associate with the enlightenment and the, the finishing of education, um, educational travel, um, which is part of what I do at Lewis University. Um, and I, I hope that Chris Swanson made it on. Um, he's doing great works um, uh, facilitating our work in, in Rome uh, through Lewis University. And then this idea of ancestral travel. Um, the exhibit profiles some great stories. Um, the adventure travel has um, somebody going to the base camp at, at Mount Everest, uh, that motorcycle trip across Canada, um, the spiritual travel of pilgrimage I'll talk about a, a bit more. Um, this grand tour, I've been looking at it for over a decade, and this idea of the enlightenment, and especially people from England, but other places as well, mostly men, but women as well, um, visiting kind of core sites, Rome, the Holy Land, Egypt, Greece as well, and this idea of a finishing school for individuals. And this could be months, but it also could be years. Um, also is a period in which um, there might be um, uh, sexual exploration. Um, um, uh, one individual called um, Italy the brothel of Europe, um, and they probably weren't wrong. Um, but this also involves same-sex relationships. Um, so there was all sorts of things going on during this grand tour. Um, uh, really worth your, your attention if you haven't encountered it before, um, and lots of new research. And then this idea of the educational um, research, and I'll, I'll profile that a little bit, and then the ancestral part that really seems to be tied to uh, genealogy and that idea of going back to the old country, wherever that is. Um, so really a fun exhibit. Um, one of my favorite corners is when you walk in and you're in the spiritual section of the exhibit. Um, and um, I'm just going to profile one work. Um, I absolutely love this work by Franklin McMahon. Um, it's on loan um, by Mark, and it, it shows um, people um, processing into St. Peter's Basilica um, during Vatican II. So this um, uh, church, ecumenical church council, um, that really transforms lots of things. Um, the movement, especially, most notably, that shift from the Latin Mass to the Vulgate, the everyday language of people. Um, I just find the, um, the, the image really compelling. Um, so um, I'm not, I sound like a huckster here. You got to go see this exhibit. Um, the education is really something else as well. Um, you can see at the top um, images of Egypt, 
Down below, you can see the Tower of Pisa. And again, this idea of um, studying abroad. Um, here's this section as it lays out on the wall. Um, my favorite um, image is that um, the copy of the painting by Caravaggio of Bacchus, um, which is um, really uh, wonderful and was part of the finishing exercise for um, somebody from Lake Forest who went to um, study painting in Italy. Um, so many great stories that bring the rich texture of Lake Forest and Lake Bluff to life. Um, I really um, encourage you to go. Um, eh, just go Tuesday or Wednesday. You're around. Come on. Um, and then finally, you have this idea of these um, um, uh, Barry McLean's collection that includes these fantastic posters. Uh, there are no distance lands. Uh, this one from 1953. Um, I like the, the use of the Australasia. Um, one flight fortnightly. Um, I just, <laughs> um, you mean every 10 days? Um, okay, uh, that, that would work for me. Um, these are really great um, pieces. Um, I'm so glad that they were able to partner um, with that fantastic map collection and has other things clearly to explore. So um, a rich experience. Um, kind of going broader for a moment and talking about pilgrimage. If you're interested in, in learning more about pilgrimage in general, I really encourage you to look at Ian Reader's small, slim volume and at Oxford, a very short um, introduction series on pilgrimage. Um, he really informed my thinking about world pilgrimage. And in fact, his um, expertise is in um, Zen Buddhism um, and that of uh, Japan. And then um, Timothy Egan, who writes for the New York Times, um, is really put together a great book on the uh, Via Fracincina um, that goes from um, Can uh, Canterbury, um, crosses the channel, and then walks all the way to Rome. Um, most of us are familiar with the Camino de Santiago, um, but this is another um, uh, way to go, uh, another famous trail. And um, the, the his ability to um, really weave his own sense of wonder um, is, is really uh, to be recommended. So two, two things I've been thinking about. Um, we believe that just about everybody in the world is involved in some form of pilgrimage. Um, I visited Malta a number of years ago and visited this megalith site. Um, and they were putting forth the, the argument that it was an area of regional um, pilgrimage for people surrounding Malta, so that they would sail over there and, and have um, rituals. Um, I found the idea really compelling. Um, so megaliths, uh, most people think Stonehenge, um, but there's a number of them on Malta. Um, fascinating. Probably the most um, well-known and a pillar of, of Islam is the Hajj. Um, and so it's uh, one of the obligations of Muslims, if they're able to, to travel to Mecca. Um, and we're coming up, I think this year it'll be in July, um, will be the, the official month of travel. Um, and it's interesting that um, I think about this, you, you make preparations, you have your experience, um, and then you come back. And I like how within Islam they have the name, you become a haji. Um, you have an honorific title that can uh, be carried with this trip um, as somebody who's made the trip. And then um, I just mentioned because of Ian Reader, uh, the Shikoku pilgrimage. Um, these were sites that were uh, um, associated with a uh, Zen Buddhist uh, Kobo Dashi. Um, 88 temples and basically you walk around an entire island. Uh, um, this also under, underlines the, the theme that oftentimes the birthplace of different individuals is a, a site of pilgrimage. So um, it seems, you know, I could go on with the, the, the travel of Hindus to the Ganges and other examples, but the, these are a few to illustrate the larger theme of pilgrimage in the world theme. Um, I'm particularly interested in um, Christian pilgrimage. Um, and I like the term that the Muslims use for the Jews, Christians, and uh, Muslims of the people of the book. Um, and for Jews, there's been a tradition of pilgrimage associated with um, visiting the temple um, when it housed the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, Christians, um, places associated with Jesus. 
um, St. Jerome, who uh, translated the, the uh, sacred writings into the Vulgate, to use that term again, into Latin, um, uh, promoted it from um, uh, Bethlehem. And then the three holiest places for Muslims, uh, Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. So um, this is where much of my work goes. Um, and speaking of birthplaces, going to the Church of Nativity. Um, so prior, just prior to um, COVID breaking out, um, we had a uh, place-based learning opportunity with um, students there. And I'll talk more about that as we go forward, but I find it really compelling and I kind of play with this idea of not only place-based where people engage with the artwork, the architecture and the core ideas, but also that for certain individuals, this would be a faith-based opportunity. So a place to kind of explore their faith. Um, but you don't have to go that far. You just, uh, if you're in Lake Forest, Lake Bluff, just go down to Baha'i um, House of Worship in Wilmette. Um, uh, this is the only uh, Baha'i uh, house of worship um, in um, uh, the, the North America. Um, there's one per continent. And so um, this is a really compelling site. Um, and the, the architecture is wonderful. Um, the founder of Baha'i, I believe, came in 1893 to the World's Columbian Exposition and was part of the um, Congress on Religions. Um, which were held in the um, newly built Art Institute building. That's what we call it today, um, the Art Institute building. So these can be far away, but they can be very nearby. Um, and then just kind of um, putting forth a couple of, of ideas, this idea of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales and this going to see the sacred remains of Thomas a Becket or um, this idea of the ground tour that's in Mark Twain's The Innocents Abroad. Um, I know Carol Summerfield enjoys this book a great deal, um, and we've talked about it. Um, in terms of really putting Christian pilgrimage on the map, um, we have a, a, a towering figure, uh, Constantine, the emperor of Rome. Um, he uh, wins the Battle of the Million Bridge, um, comes in and takes Rome, and very shortly creates the toleration of Christianity within the empire, um, I believe in 313. Um, and we have this idea of uh, his mother, St. Helena, going to the Holy Land and kind of designating cer certain sites. And one of the most famous discoveries is, is uh, featured here, the um, finding of the true cross at the site of um, the um, uh, death and burial of Jesus. Um, also, that's, so that's in the early 4th century. In the late 300s, we have Egeria. Um, uh, some believe that she's from Spain, maybe uh, France. Um, many believe that she was a religious woman, um, but she has some of the first accounts of what the Christian pilgrimage would look like. So if you were interested in this theme, um, Egeria is a good place to start. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to touch on um, John Paul II, um, now St. John Paul II. Um, and, and I guess when I address the, the church issues, um, uh, I, I feel compelled that anytime we discuss the church, we have to bring up the um, sex abuse scandal, um, which has still not been fully addressed by the church um, and was uh, really coming to light during um, the uh, uh, papacy of John Paul II. Um, um, significantly, greatly popular. Um, and, um, but he does have a, a wonderful letter on pilgrimage um, setting up um, in preparation for the Jubilee year of 2000. Um, I, I was in Rome during the Jubilee of 2000 um, and it was amazing. Um, so many people made their way um, to Rome at that period. Um, and when I was last in Rome at Christmas, they had that advertisement, and I just loved it with um, St. Nicholas cutting across with the um, um, Prosecco. Um, but um, this idea of a chance to walk with God is kind of the, my main takeaway from that letter. Um, so um, I recommend it to you um, as something to look at. Um, oftentimes we use this term of walking, but also this term of sauntering. 
And um, the root of the word was um, people were hearing people leaving from France, going towards the Holy Land, and they were saying, a sacritaire, a sa they're sauntering. They are going on their way to the Holy Land, the uh, 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 Holy Land. And this is so rich. The, just say the words, Jerusalem, the place where King David was, or Jesus, or where Muhammad, by tradition, ascended. Um, this is really uh, uh, full of uh, potent power. Um, the Christian pilgrimage, um, they say, and it just happened on December 12th, the uh, feast day of the, at the shrine at um, uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, is the most visited of these sites, um, a, a site associated with Mary and an apparition. Um, many sites associated with the Holy Land, especially New Testament sites. Um, Rome in particular, um, you know, Martin Luther walks 800 miles down, enters the city and says, oh, the city of the sacred martyrs. Um, in particular, he's talking about St. Peter, who is buried under St. Peter's Basilica and St. Paul. And then we also have saints and, and miracles. So we have sites like um, the El Camino de Santiago, which takes you to Santiago. And um, again, I guess I hedge a little bit the um, uh, purported remains of St. James um, Major. Um, also, um, we have miracle sites, um, uh, one from the mid 19th century, um, Our Lady of Lords. So um, all of these are sites of uh, devout pilgrimage. Um, just to touch on why I was going to the Holy Land, um, Lewis University is, is sponsored by the uh, De La Salle Christian Brothers, and um, they are also the sponsors of Bethlehem University. It's a fascinating place um, um, in Bethlehem, um, in uh, the West Bank, um, and having these um, people come together. Um, uh, Narmeen, who studied nursing at Lewis and is now teaching at Bethlehem University, she's from Palestine, and having the opportunity of our students to be together with them, um, really spectacular. Um, and it's very interesting to me that we have a uh, Catholic presence in the West Bank, um, but the 70% of the students, maybe just a bit over that, are Muslim. Um, and so that important um, interfaith dynamic there as well. Um, when we were visiting um, uh, uh, President Emeritus um, uh, from Lewis University, James Gaffney was there um, and uh, good enough to host the students uh, in that community. Um, my early work um, was on Constantinian basilicas. Here I am about to enter what I'm going to call the cave of the Church of the Nativity, and I'm going to illuminate that a bit more. Um, also, there's this huge drag, the, um, the uh, 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 Banksy in um, uh, Bethlehem, uh, the, the uh, protesters throwing the, the bouquet of flowers or the Holy Family next to the, the, the wall. Um, he seems to get it right most of the time, um, whoever this Banksy is, right? Um, but, um, you know, when we're going to the Holy Land, it depends on what you see, right? Is it the Temple Mount? Is it um, uh, the, the site of the temple that was destroyed in 70 by the Romans? Is it sites where Jesus walked? Is it the site where Muhammad ascended to heaven? It's, it's hard to say, um, but needless to say, it's compelling. Um, and it's all worthy of uh, uh, visits. Um, in terms of um, Israel, Palestine, the sites, the Church of the Nativity, the birthplace, Church of the Leona, a place where Jesus taught, and then the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, where tradition says Jesus was crucified, died, buried, and if you're a believer, resurrected. Um, these ideas of St. Peter's, I've already mentioned St. Paul's, and then John the Ladder and the Cathedral of Rome, um, other sites that were designated by Constantine as sites for um, uh, marking them as basilicas. And then finally, um, the sites that I've been interested in kind of pulling together in a seven-sided star. So the big, imagine the Big Dipper pointing your way towards God, perhaps. Um, big Dipper has seven stars. Um, is um, the Irene Church um, in Constantinople, um, Istanbul today. Um, but this idea of Hagia Sophia that most of us are familiar with. Um, and what I'm very interested in is... Um, um, 
Constantine left Rome and never went back. He created a new Christian capital at Constantinople um, and also uh, was there uh, just over the um, on the Asian side where they did the Council of Nicaea. Um, so this idea of orthodoxy. So I use these to teach um, about Christianity to our students. Um, uh, uh, um, just showing a few quick images, a classic basilica with an apse, um, a, a law um, a meeting place form for the Romans. Um, uh, Christians need places to gather. Um, it's different from the kind of the Roman religions where they would be outside. Um, here's an exterior view. Um, and then this is the site in the cave. And ultimately, we're going to be talking about three caves, caves at these sites the area where Jesus by tradition was um, born. And this insight into this cave idea very nearby um, to um, uh, Bethlehem is Shepherd's Field, a, a site um, uh, run by the Franciscans. And this gives you an insight into what this might have looked like at the time. I think it's super helpful making your way through these caves because they're in a semi-arid climate. Um, um, with um, big differences between um, night and day in terms of heat and cold, and um, these areas where um, you can set up and meet today. Um, the Eleona Church, um, the, um, uh, the Dominican um, uh, Gregory Tate, uh, Tate um, um, was able to tour me there with his students. And this idea of a church that's now a ruin. So I'm using the cursor. Um, Carol, shake your head if you can see the cursor. So here are the doors. And so it's a remnant church, but here's where the altar was. And of course, we would find another cave. So this is up on the Mount of Olives, looking over the Temple Mount. And um, you'd have another place where Jesus um, taught his disciples. Um, so another site there. And then ultimately today, it's been called the Potter Noster Church, the Our Father Church with all of these tiles that um, have the translations of the, um, the Lord's Prayer um, in various languages. And then finally, um, probably the most important site, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Here's a model. This has been greatly changed over time. Um, but here's a, uh, a, a reproduction, this idea of kind of a um, entry area, um, but marking, um, I'm using my cursor again, marking the uh, Golgotha, the site of the crucifixion um, and the site of the burial. Um, and we have a major change um, as a crusader church, reorientation of the church. Um, but today we have kind of a Greek Orthodox looking um, section there with the crucifixion, um, the preparation of the body, a newer um, work of art, and then the edicule with the um, um, uh, tomb of um, uh, Jesus below it. Um, powerful sites, um, um, really powerful sites. You can see it from above. Um, and we, you have, again, this area, which was where the uh, crucifixion, a dome over the main area um, with the burial site. Um, some of you who know the area also, can, you can climb up to the top of the Lutheran church there um, in their tower. So um, that was all kind of talking about pilgrimage and the work that I've done in the past. Um, um, I was on sabbatical and continued to work with these themes, developing a course um, for civic engagement and getting students to go out to different sites um, and interact with the information. Um, uh, maybe it's because I'm a Christian. I think of this as a three-part process, um, very Trinitarian, but this idea of um, preparation of mind, body, and spirit, the pilgrimage, being open to that experience, the spirit of transformation, and then this idea of return. Um, what did you learn? Is there a reflection? Is there a new reality? Um, that's what you might hope for. And I'm gonna kind of take you through my own experience. Again, I made the trip the end of September into October this year. Um, and part of it was involving language preparation, um, walking a lot. Um, and then also um, uh, my friend Luther Grafe and I decided to, um, that we wanted to get the Compostela, um, the statement that said that you'd walk the hundred kilometers. 
um, for spiritual reasons. You can do it for athletic reasons, to cover the distance, um, but we wanted to do it um, with that in mind. Um, just, a, just a few things that I was listening to, because you ended up walking a lot in preparation. Um, every morning I'd get up and I would do a half an hour of my Pimsleur language program. Um, I finished both Spanish one and Spanish two, um, um, and uh, 30 lessons each. Um, it's amazing, you just download it on your phone from the library and it pops up. Um, I um, really enjoyed um, Joyce Salisbury, um, The History of Spain. Again, many lectures in the great courses. Um, but what I really liked was it was it made um, uh, Spain the center of the story. So um, oftentimes you're, you're studying the Reformation or other things like that might be more associated with Germany, other areas, um, uh, Swiss, for, for example, under Calvin. But here, everything was focused on Spain. It was a really wonderful experience. Um, uh, Carol Summerfield and I talked a lot about this book as well, Neil Gaiman's American Gods, which is a fascinating story about all of these gods kind of a complex story, but um, in order to exist, say Isis or Odin or somebody else, you still have to have believers in the world. Otherwise you cease to exist. Um, it's a fascinating book um, and really fun. And again, it accompanied me on the way. And I um, do like the Rick Steves series um, because he focuses on history. Um, and I did, um, I watched it years ago, Martin Sheen's uh, book on the way, I mean, movie on the way. Um, so the president of the United States, goes on a coming up now okay that's a little crossing up the, his roles um um thinking about what we mainly did i'm here we started from lugo and then we made our way to santiago de compostela and just so you know we took a train up to la coruña up here which is associated with the old port a uh, roman port um and has the oldest lighthouse um um, extant lighthouse. So um, we're up in Galicia, um, and that brought some of its own challenges. Um, I want to thank Laura McDaniel um, for lending me a book, and I took that map out of it. Um, the preparation um, tested a lot of shoes. Um, walked our longest walk was ten and a half miles. Um, um, so that was pretty good. I probably should have done more. Um, the, uh, yeah, I've already talked about most of this, um, uh, and I did, did use multiple, check out multiple guidebooks, um, just kind of um, triangulating what we were doing. Um, what was very key, we use Carreros, which is a service that brings your larger bag forward to each site. So we had um, um, uh, reservations at a number of sites so that we could take advantage of that service. Um, the, the itinerary, again, um, Karen was on earlier in this idea of a two-week uh, 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 trip. Um, we had kind of culture early on with Madrid, uh, Lyon, uh, Lugo with its great Roman wall. We then made our Camino um, to Santiago and then ended up going to La Coruña, as noted, and then we left out of Madrid again. Um, we used uh, public transportation between all of these sites. Um, probably one of the funnest was being on the high-speed train from Madrid up to Lyon and watching the odometer, which is in all the cars, go 299, 299, um, we're going kilometers, and then finally it hit 300, um, and so uh, 300 kilometers an hour, why not? Um, when you're thinking about the Camino, there's many routes, um, and I just used this because it was a map that seemed that it was going to show up clearly for all of you. Um, the most uh, popular route, so there's about 300,000 people each year who do some part of the Camino. That's, that's kind of the estimate. And um, this was also a jubilee year, but also very limited because of COVID. And so you have this idea of um, the French Way, which leads um, uh, San Pierre P uh, Piedport um, and cuts all the way across northern Spain. Um, there's the northern route. There's the Portuguese route. There's a number of routes. These are actually kind of the main ones. Um, I was very interested in um, the, the Camino Primitivo. It was the first route. Um, remember um, Spain, this became very popular in the Middle Ages. This is a discovery, of, I believe, in the ninth century of the remains of St. James. And um, Alphonse um, 
the seventh, I hope, um, uh, but the, the king of the region of northern Spain uh, makes the, the trek from Oviedo <coughs> through Lugo to Santiago, and he verifies the remains. Um, um, so we made our way to Madrid and we toured the palace and the cathedral and other sites. Um, we um, took public transportation. You can kind of see our bags. We had one larger bag and then our backpacks, um, kind of day bags really um, for water and things. Um, um, we visited a lot of churches and, and I, I hope you can see this. There were pilgrims masses um, in the evenings, usually at seven o'clock in pretty much every town. And so you could go, um, usually you'd leave for sure by eight. That's when your bag was due downstairs uh, for it to be picked up. Um, you'd have a little bit of breakfast and start walking, ideally arrive by say two, three or four, um, uh, get cleaned up and then be able to go out explore and then go to dinner after the, um, uh, the mass. Um, um, uh, a different feature for many individuals is this idea of, well, first the vernacular. So your Spanish helps until you get into a region where they're speak, maybe speaking Galician um, or using, or in a very thick accent. Um, this idea of lots of relics, um, it feels like CSI a lot, um, crime scene investigation. This is like, so why is that arm on display, right? Um, but these, um, the power of saints to um, have been models for us in the past and continue to um, uh, be involved with us uh, in our spiritual lives um, and thinking a lot about art and architecture. Um, and so um, I, I identify as a Catholic. Um, and so I do believe in the intercession of saints. I know I can go directly to God. Um, my friend Luther is a, a Luther. Uh, Lutheran, um, no surprise there, and um, he he will acknowledge that they can be there for inspiration for us. Um, also, much to his dismay, I was working on a plenary indulgence, um, but I didn't go to confession, so I didn't um, get a remission of all my earthly sins. What was I thinking? Um, but um, maybe next time. Um, the um, architecture was spectacular. This is San Isidoro. Um, I became a real fan of him, um, a, um, a saint from the Middle Ages. Um, you can see on the left, the doorway is Romanesque with the round Roman and the small um, uh, bas relief here. And then you can see that there was an addition onto the church with a riotous, you can see the um, Gothic window here and the um, uh, arches, just a spectacular space. Um, San Isidoro is right there under the, um, in the, the altar. Um, and I kind of felt like I was chasing him for a while. Um, um, the older part of the church has um, 13th century, I believe that's right, 13th century frescoes. Um, um, they are spectacular and have been kind of sealed off from the main church when they made their modifications of the church. Um, we then made our, um, in, in Le that's in Lyon, um, you can see that we're in Lyon, um, and it has a spectacular, what I would call a French Gothic church. And one of those main ideas is when you have um, transportation routes, and the El Camino really is a transportation route, for sure you're looking for the movement of people, um, and that, that's true. You have the movement of goods as well, um, things making their way back and forth. But what's really interesting to me is this movement of ideas, that the Gothic is really spreading in this way with these stained glass windows. This is just a fantastic example, um, equal to anything I've seen in France, um, a, a really wonderful church. Um, there we are um, taking advantage of the photo op um, that Lyon affords. Um, we took a bus for three hours. It, it, it took a break for half an hour um, to uh, Lugo. Um, this is a, um, one of those uh, World Heritage Sites. It has a, a mile and a quarter Roman wall that still encircles the city. Most of these have been knocked down. In the 60s and 70s, they talked about knocking it down, um, but um, it still exists. Um, and so you can see, again, almost have the same view. Here's the cathedral in town, and here's the Roman wall. Um, we're at one of the rare spots where uh, it's, it's still built up. Um, high as it was in the past um, for the soldiers to be in. 
Um, this this story. So I, I don't know if you can make it out. So when you're going, the the trails along the the Primitivo are excellent, um, and they are frequent and very helpful. Um, and if you look down here, it says ninety eight point eight five zero. Well, wait a minute. We're supposed to go a hundred kilometers. So we walk cross town late at night after dinner. We're looking for something that's going to look exactly like this. And we go straight and there's nothing. And we go to the right and there's nothing. We go to the left. There's nothing. We go down the hill and we're getting very frustrated after an hour and a half. And we're still looking around. And I finally asked this guy who's walking his dog, Don Decada El Cien Kilometro. Where's the 100 kilometer side? You can see the street light. It's the size of a house. Um, and so we had clearly missed it. Because um, <laughs> we were looking um, for something else. We were looking for this. Um, not this. Um, oh, small, big. Okay. All right. Um, and then when we're thinking about St. James, it's also important that this is caught up in... Um, kind of the three individuals who are St. James. Um, the apostle um, called by Jesus, um, the Matamoros, um, which is a very disturbing idea, the uh, Mata, the killer of Moors. Um, so this is uh, at a period where the uh, Moors, the Muslims from North Africa had moved into Spain and had taken almost the entire peninsula. Um, and ultimately, um, um, in 1492, Isabella and Ferdinand clear them off, feeling so good about themselves, having um, expelled the Jews and the, the Muslims, that ultimately they sent Christopher Columbus on his merry way. Um, and we all know how that turned out so well. Um, but um, uh, there's, there's that idea. But what's interesting is when I, I, I come back to John Paul II, who traveled everywhere during his papacy, um, this popular idea of uh, the pilgrim um, with the broad-brimmed hat. I guess he always has the broad-brimmed hat. Over here we have him um, killing, um, this is actually from uh, outdoor statues, so the, the poor moors underneath have been kind of destroyed a bit. But the, the, the markers, the walking stick, the gourd for water, um, the shells of St. James, um, for um, some say for gathering water, some say for eating, um, but this symbol of St. James. Um, I must confess, I, as much as I like the history of all of these, my favorite form of St. James is in the cake. Um, the cake's available almost everywhere along the Camino, and you can just ask for a slice of it. Um, St. James is delicious as a cake. Um, and so I would encourage you to go have the St. James cake. Um, um, we finally went on our way, um, and so there's Luther. We're looking very fresh. We crossed the Roman bridge over the river, and you can see in the bottom right, um, we're, we've got Santiago in the background. So we were um, traveling for four days, um, well, five days walking to get to Santiago. <coughs> One day was um, uh, 17 miles because I couldn't get rooms um, lined up at kind of the intervals I wanted. Um, and Luther had a Fitbit, and with meals and church visits, um, we did 50,000 steps that day. Um, that turns out to be 26.2 um, miles. Um, we walked a marathon on the second day, um, making me wish that hey, we walked further than um, 10 and a half miles in preparation. Um, I did battle some blisters. Luther did not at all. Um, it turns very rural quickly. Um, in my little bit of Spanish, I had a conversation with this man who just loves his life as a gentleman farmer with the cattle. Um, one of our first stops was at a garage that had been transformed with a bathroom and vending machine so that you could just come. They raised the, the doors in the morning. Um, you can leave a donation um, for the use of the bathroom. Um, I picked up um, some additional water and I think some um, nuts from the machine. Um, and then on the right, if you can see it, um, Luther standing there, some of the trails were just idyllic, um, unbelievable. Um, my favorite was really the graffiti. I love that um, uh, Spain has anarchists. Um, I like the one, um, change the system, not the climate. 
<laughs> it's a pretty good one. Um, I didn't get the whole thing in, but um, my way to uh, Christ, it's not to Chris. Um, and then the best of them all, um, call a taxi, um, the, the, the snake of temptation. Um, people do call taxis, but then where they get picked up, they go to their hotel and then they go back the next morning with a taxi to their spot and um, continue to walk. Um, but it's not a bad idea. <laughs> Um, and then, what the heck? I, I don't even know what to do with that, but it just makes me laugh every time I read it. Um, this is no sharks, no party. Um, I, I would say you're right. Um, um, one of our first stops were here at San Ramon, um, de Retorta, um, and we got very late to a tavern. Um, I think they closed at 2. We got there at one forty. Um, they made us a ham sandwich. Um, and uh, gave us a, a glass, we bought a glass of wine and had a coffee. Um, uh, the first night was at a albergue, O Candido. Um, um, very rural, um, very musty, um, but the best part of it was meeting the group that you're gonna be with um, because you're kind of crossing paths along the way. Um, Luther and I left first thing in the morning and all of a sudden, here come the Dutch. And as they got closer to me, they started going. <laughs> and I just, I started whistling with them and they were making time. They had done that Oviedo to Lugo section is a big mountain, very difficult. These guys were very fit. You can see them there. Um, and so the Dutch were out in force and they were mainly interested in covering distance. Um, it was, a uh, the French were a, uh, a uh, husband wife team who had taken a two week vacation and done sections of the pilgrimage for I think over a decade. And we just go back and start again and start getting their um, uh, uh, credential stamped. Um, the Spaniards, uh, many of them, there was a group from Seville of about 12 people. Um, I'll bring up this term of Dulcinea in a minute, uh, the, the character from um, uh, Don Quixote. Um, we were passed at one point by 90 high school students. Um, with six professors. And of course, I end up talking to the history professor as she goes by, and um, two young men who were also at this place. So um, that we crossed the um, high school students when they we joined from the Primitivo into the French way uh, for the last two days. Um, kind of a different experience, um, much more populated. Um, only about 3% of the people walk the um, Camino Primitivo. Um, we went over a number of large hills, but maybe mountains. Um, and you can see in the background are the windmills. Um, the latest New Yorker has um, uh, the windmills featured there. And it's interesting the conversations you have. Hey, Luther, have you ever um, heard the story of Don Quixote um, and his love for the, the sweet Dulcinea um, and the horse Rasanante? Um, and in this scenario, unfortunately, Luther gets to be the gaunt um, Don Quixote, and I get to be a little bit of the Sancho Panza because of my Panza. Um, but that's all right. Um, it was a good telling of the story as we went forward. Um, just this distinctive part of the feature, I thought there were little churches. This is actually, Galicia is very wet, damp climate um, uh, associated with Gaul. Um, and the Celts and was actually uh, linked to Ireland um, and England. Um, and so these, these Celtic people, and so they um, used to store their grain in these structures um, and they still exist as features in the yards. Um, not all of the um, roads were idyllic and we were on um, sort of busy sideways, um, byways. Um, um, please moderate your speed. Um, and then finally, we're going to get to Santiago, and I'm working my cursor, and there's Santiago in the distance, this hill of joy, um, just five kilometers left into the city. Um, and so we had really good weather, and you get to the um, great Romanesque masterpiece, a World Heritage Site as well. And at the base of it, under the main altar, are the remains of St. James. And so um, this is all... Um, part of where you're going in that kind of mystery of, of taking a pilgrimage um, and um, thinking about your own mortality, um, your own life, taking stock. Um, we were very lucky that um, 
uh, Julia had a um, classmate, uh, the exchange program for the high schools was Ana Fernandez was from Santiago. And so she stayed with us. And so the family was thrilled to host us. Um, and really it was interesting because I was quite skeptical linking these stories to the um, throwing out of the Moors and St. James showing up by tradition miraculously as a white knight um, fighting off the Moors. Um, and um, Rafa is, uh, has a master's in theology and really um, made a strong argument for why he believed that these were the remains of St. James. Um, and so, and that really came to me because going out to this site modified in the 19th century by the English, but um, this site of the Roman lighthouse and the river system that would make this possible um, in the first century. So um, this whole idea of a pilgrimage and San Isidoro um, and chasing him, um, he's the, the peasant who wanted to, uh, the farmer, the patron saint of farmers who wanted to pray. And so God sent angels um, to plow his fields for him so he could pray. Um, uh, going quickly, this experience of walking is powerful. The setting aside time to be unplugged, to reflect, um, that whole idea that we are alone together. Um, ultimately, those classical ideals of truth and beauty and goodness at these sites. Um, Plato would say goodness. Augustine might say God. He definitely say God. Um, and this idea of can you place yourself in this narrative? Can you tell your own story as part of what happens on these pilgrimages? So um, I thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about Milestone Travels um, uh, and uh, talk about the theme of pilgrimage. And I will take questions if there are any um, and um, see if Carol had any in the chat. All right, well, um, we don't have any yet, but I've got a couple of questions. So you know, you'd undertaken this, um, partly because you are working on this uh, idea of pilgrimage, right? Yeah. Uh, in, in what it did for your, ex you had expectations going into it and then you come out of it. Like what were the surprising components of it? <laughs> what lived up to or surpassed what your expectations had been? Yeah, I, I think um, the, uh, the as, as a Catholic, um, the access to mass, um, we went to mass four days in a row. Poor mm -hmm. Luther, right? Um, uh, the, there was pilgrimage masses at the end. Um, I know this is going to sound like the the song for Genovia, but the first experience where the guy says, "Now we're going to sing the song of, of Santiago," it's like Santiago, Santiago, and I'm just like, "Did you watch that show about the little princess?" Um, but it was um, it was a great experience, and that I didn't quite expect. All right, so one question. So did female pilgrims um, like Egeria have the same access to sites as male pilgrims? Because that was one of the things you didn't talk about with Mecca is that it is a male only experience, right? Yeah. And that for a lot of folks, these were very restrictive to it being the idea that it is only accessible by men. Yeah, and that, that's a really interesting idea because I think um, um, the, the, the Catholic Church asks, in particular, Christianity asks really great questions, um, but in terms of these questions of uh, the role of women, haven't quite figured it out. Um, the, the women had all the access um, that I had as well, um, and there were lots of women um, um, walking, so um, um, I didn't see that as a problem. And the, In fact, there was one woman that we met um, late at night who was... Um, largely on her own. She'd been walking with a group that sent them ahead um, because she was having leg problems. Mm. Um, so she was, she felt comfortable going on her own. Okay, another question. So were any of these sites ever closed for political reason or were, is there sort of a um, overriding openness for people who are making pilgrimages beyond the political boundaries? Yeah, so I guess two thoughts. Um, the first one, which is really interesting is when you're walking along, um, you can say good morning to somebody, just a simple um, buenos dias, and they'll come back and they'll see what you're doing and they'll say buon camino, right? 
And so I just kind of bring up that idea that this have a good walk, have a good way. But I, I loved one of, and I wasn't able to get it because it was way too big, um, a graffiti that said Buon Camino, which is a great thing. And it said Buon Turismo, right? This is a major money maker for Galicia. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, COVID made it difficult. Um, one of my disappointments, and it was a minor disappointment because I understood COVID, they only allowed 300 um, um, pilgrims into the church for mass. And so mm -hmm. we stood in line twice for an hour and um, we didn't make it into the, the church for mass at Santiago. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the only thing. All right, so um, Laura said, speaking to equal access and tying it to the local, the Baha'i do believe that all are equal. Men, women, color of skin, worth a visit given its local geography. Nice, excellent. And it is a great site. It, it's a stunner. And they have a great it, visitor center there. Yeah, all right, so where do you wanna go next? What's next on the checklist? Boy, next. Um, well, I, we're, we're waiting to see. Um, unfortunately, um, Rome has moved to level four. Um, and so um, I was planning on being in Rome um, February, March, April. Um, so that feels like it's up in the air. But I would really like to revisit um, some of those great um, churches in Rome, um, in particular, um, St. Paul's Outside the Walls. Um, mm -hmm. I've only been there twice in my life and would really like to go back with a uh, eye towards studying it more. Um, mm -hmm. So let, let's hope that um, the program is able to go. Very good. All right. Any other questions from the audience? No. Thank you so much. It was really interesting. And as always, highly entertaining. Um, I, I appreciate all that you've done for the museum and will continue to do. And um, I look forward to whatever occasion we have to bring you in to speak again. Um, I'd like to thank, again, our sponsors, um, uh, Green Oaks at Sheridan and uh, Maddie Dugan for sponsoring these events. We're really pleased to be able to provide them for free because we believe it gives better access to everyone regardless of means. Um, so if you can, please continue to contribute to the museum. It helps us keep these programs moving forward and we look forward to seeing you at the exhibit. Alex, anything to add? Um, if you're interested in travel, which I hope you are, we have a couple other upcoming programs, which I think will be of interest. Uh, January 13th, Dr. Gretchen Sullivan Soren of the Cooperstown Graduate Program is gonna be speaking on the subject, Driving While Black, which talks about the um, both the opportunities and the dangers um, afforded to members of the Black community as motorists throughout history, which is gonna be really interesting and a very important conversation as well. And then February 24th, um, Dennis pointed out uh, Franklin McMahon's Vatican II picture that's up in our exhibit. And actually his daughter, Deborah McMahon Osterholtz wrote a book about her parents' travel exploits, both her father as an illustrator and her mother as a writer. And she's gonna be sharing those with us also via Zoom and then will again be February 24th. So I hope they'll be able to join us for a couple of those. All right, thank you all again um, for joining us. Um, I hope you found it valuable and I look forward to seeing you at the next Zoom lecture. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, Dennis. Again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dennis.